Hello, I'm Mary Elizabeth Xiao from Asian Uplift, and today we're interviewing Romel Conquara. He is a Bay Area native Filipino American. He served in the U.S. Marine Corps before graduating from San Francisco State University's Broadcast and Electronic Communications Arts Program. And he's currently working for the Filipino Channel as an Emmy nominated reporter and producer. In 2017, he started the Kapwa Collective, a media platform that celebrates Filipino Americans. Hello. Hi, Mary. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you today. Where were you born and where did you grow up? Well, I was born in San Francisco, um, but my family moved to Daly City, like many Filipino uh, families did in the, in the 80s. Uh, but I grew up in uh, Daly City. Uh, I, I like to say for, for all the locals, it's right between uh, Ceremony and uh, or more so right between Gillard Park and Classic Bowl. So right there, uh, you can't miss me. How has growing up in the city influenced who you are today? I'm blessed to be from the, the Bay Area. Uh, and I say that uh, having lived outside of the Bay Area, uh, like you, like in that very kind intro, uh, you gave me, uh, you know, my time in the military has brought me around this country, uh, around the world. And yeah, even though we are in a bubble, but it does make me appreciate just the diversity uh, and learning of different cultures, appreciating of different cultures. And, um, you know, and, and I'm, again, blessed to be around my Filipino community uh, because, you know, having that identity, um, that, that ongoing quest, as I call it, to find my identity as a Filipino American, um, I'm, I've been lucky and blessed uh, to have many of my community around me. What was it like exactly to grow up in a community where you have all of your community around you and you have so many places to learn from, so many places to be with your community? Yeah, uh, so it was a lot of indirect and direct stuff. I think indirect is mainly from like my family, just because, you know, the typical things like food, language, uh, customs and things like that, but also um, directly uh, as far as um, community groups, whether it be Filipino-based community groups, community groups in school, like Filipino-based uh, educational communities. Uh, lucky to have uh, blessed to go to Skyline College where uh, in San Bruno learning um, and being part of the couple buy and learning community there. And then going to SF State um, from the um, Filipino American Collegiate Endeavor, uh, learning uh, the history there. Um, it's, it's, it's been great to, um, to, to learn looking for it and to learn not looking for it, if that makes sense. How did your love for media begin and how has it turned into what it is now? My thing as a little boy was always Superman and Ghostbusters. Uh, and I, I had this thing of growing up to be, uh, well, I couldn't really be a Ghostbuster. Uh, well, that time, time may tell on that one, but like the, the aspect of being, I guess, just overall a good guy and then learning and learning about the news and, and wanting to um, help people. I mean, that, I, I think that's where my journalism, uh, the birth of like this idea of being a journalist uh, came to be. And then growing up, uh, having the Filipino channel in my house, um, seeing that along with mainstream news, it's like, you know, trying to find representation in media uh, and knowing that there's so many Filipinos around me, but like not really our stories being told nonetheless. And then going and then learning about and interning at the TFC uh, news station where there's our stories being told, but it, it's with an older generation. So it's just become that love or more of a duty, I would like to say, of trying to get our stories out there and the stories that represent not only my community, but the my generation. And then what was it like to grow up with that kind of lack of representation in the mainstream media? It, it was just waiting. It was just waiting until like, um, are we, are we ever going to get like a, a light shine on us? Like, do we have to jump in front of the camera? Because I know we, and, uh, I'll take a step back. The waiting turned into like, like I'm a, we're just going to do it. We're like, I, I remember vividly as, as, a, as a teenager, um, seeing, uh, going to these festivals in the city and going to, and then hearing, and then especially with the, with the Filipino American, uh, uh, I'd say R&B explosion in in the late '90s and early 2000s. I was like, "Yo, why, why are we?" And you know, being on having some of that music being on Wall Nine for Nine and and KML, and it was like, "Okay, 
that's the sign. Like, we're not waiting anymore. We're just going to do it. And if they see it, then good for them because we know we're dope. So, um, uh, and I, and I'm just following that, that formula, honestly, uh, you know, working at the Filipino channel, um, now having the ability to get those stories, the stories that I want, um, broadcast. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm just following that formula. What are some of your big influ influences? I know you mentioned R and B. I know you also love hip hop. How has that affected you? I think hip hop, R and B. Uh, there's, um, there's just this attitude about it, right? Uh, um, for better or worse, um, but it, it's very braggadocious. But it's also very. There's a lot of confidence that goes with it. And there's like a style, and like this just really cool attitude of like. Like, you know, we don't have, um, it doesn't have to be perfect, but we think it's cool. So we're just going to hold that down, especially here in the Bay Area, especially here in the Bay Area where like our, uh, a lot of our music is very regional and, and it's, it's being copied and duplicated in other cities. But um, I think that's why a lot of Filipino and Filipino Americans, we gravitate towards hip hop, or at least in my generation, uh, with the DJs and the break dancers, because um, you know that that's just something where we shine. We love to party. We love the music. We love the attitude. We love the culture, and we kind of just infuse that with like our culture or with our customs, and uh, we grew up with it. As you've grown into become more of an activist and a video producer, how, what have you noticed some issues facing your community today? It's it's really this idea of being Asian American. Um, of, you know, keeping your head down and just staying in your lane and, you know, not really rocking the boat and, you know, don't want to, you, you just, just focus on what you got to do. And if people are going to take some shots at you, you're just going to eat it and, you know, just, um, you know, um, beat them with success. Right. And again, there's, I guess there, there's, there's good and bad to that. But, but what I've also seen now is that especially in the last few years is that people uh, are now, they're not taking it anymore. You know, they're not just like trying to stay in their lane and be quiet. Like, no, they're, they're really, they're going to say something. And, um, and that's just not with our community. That's with, I think it's also a generational thing. So I'm, I'm uh, very happy to see that um, people uh, who are my age and, and younger are really uh, becoming more vocal and more confident and, and saying that that no things are the way things are I mean, yeah maybe they might have worked before but we're not going to take that anymore and that's everything from like representation in media uh, to abuse to uh, acceptance whether it be with religion sexual se sexual orientation um, uh, sexism uh, the feminist movement or as I uh, in, in our community, uh, the, the Panayism, and that's like really the, uh, Filipino women empowerment. Uh, it, it's it's been great to see uh, see this revolution, uh, some may say. Have you also noticed issues like housing issues, cost of living, changing demographics, things like that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, growing up in Daly City, um, I mean, obviously it's very Filipino and it's, and it's always been like that. But I like to say that like it's becoming even more Filipino or even or we're seeing different communities come in. And that, there's nothing wrong with that. But like I would say that it was more diverse in the, in the 90s. I mean, my best friend, uh, uh, he was he lived down the my neighbor. Uh, he was uh, Fijian and my best friend down the block. He was he, he was black and uh, I would and playing at Gillard Park and we would see so many different people there. And, and um, getting to understand these different cultures was great, but you know, with the housing crisis, the cost of living because of the tech boom, obviously we, I see that in San Francisco, uh, it's, it's being spread here in Daly City. And like, for example, my, the, the house I grew up in, that was, that was built, I think in the fifties or sixties, um, is now going for like at least a million dollars. And these are families uh, or, or tech people who have the money will buy these houses. Um, and we're see, I'm seeing that all over Daly City. And more so now, uh, the, the coverages that I've done uh, for the last seven years that I've been with the Filipino channel is the gentrification that's what's happening to the Filipino community, especially in the South Market neighborhood. 
um, where the tech boom is really um, has really erupted with all these new development high rise and condos and I mean don't get me wrong it looks great it looks cool but these families who lived here who immigrated here who made a living um, they're getting pushed out and it sucks because you know and I would even include myself on this um, being a native to the Bay Area we get to see all these cool things happen and 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 these cool buildings that people are living in but we don't get to be part of it so it you know it's and, and and then with these people who come in like you know not all of them but there's like no respect uh when it comes to you know the people who are from here you know i always like i hear this quote all the time I forget uh, i don't know if it's psych but you know um you know i'll do respect um you flew here but i grew here you know um this is our home and you know there is a reason why the Bay Area has been always unique. It's because of those cultures, um, not just with the Filipino community, with the Latino community, with the Black community, uh, with all these different people. And they and the heart and soul is leaving uh, the Bay Area. Um, and it looks like, and and I, this this is why I can quote, quote uh, Tony Robles. He's a poet from San Francisco. It looks like San, San Francisco just got a facelift. And you know, but that doesn't hide all, all the scars or, or the other ugly parts uh, that some people would call it. How has your work in TV and media, and even as an activist, kind of combated and addressed those issues you mentioned, like the new people coming in, and even the feminist issues? There are people. Uh, there are corporations that are that are working with different communities, um, and. And there are there are people transplants who are who are I would say motivated by the type of activism or or issues that are being brought up by the community and they have become allies. Um, you know, doing this work and and seeing them covering everything from rallies to protests um, and those protests uh, can vary. Like we've I've done stories where they uh, there's a developer who would buy um, a four unit house and these each of those families have been living there for multiple generations and just uh ellis act the victim which is when you buy the if you buy the property you could evict you could evict the tenants um uh for no reason that because you are the new owner like they can just vacate so i've, I've been at protests where they've the, the entire filipino american community would be at the home of these developers or at, outside of their of where they work and and demand, you know, like some accountability. Uh, and then especially in the, in the last year uh, with um, the death of George Floyd and, and uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, you know, all the protests that were happening uh, last summer, um, being there, uh, seeing the Black Asian solidarity, uh, and then have that kind of continue now with, with the rise of attacks against Asians, um, you know, it's it's, really i feel like it, again it's my duty it's my responsibility to um echo the the actions and the issues that that uh, our community is is uh, is fighting for and then how did you exactly get into the work that you do today i used to write for my high school newspaper and i always had this feeling again that i wanted to be a reporter i wanted to be in news but it, I really didn't get that until I was deployed to Iraq in 2006. Um, leading up to my deployment, I, you know, I'm watching the news, seeing how bad it is. Of course, you know, like you would be concerned. I would, I was concerned. And then going there and coming back, and then I would watch news, especially cable news, and the way they would talk about uh, what was happening out there was like sensationalism. And I thought it was wrong and I thought it was really, really stupid. And so I, that even further fueled my fire to get into this industry because there has to be truth tellers. There has to be people to hold um, even the media accountable for what they're doing. Uh, and then to actually get on the ground and talk to the people who are going through it. I mean, it's great to have like experts and analysis, but like until you're there, you're that person who is losing their home being harassed, any of these issues, like 
we need to put a human face to an issue. And I think that's uh, the main reason why um, that pushed me to get into journalism. And, um, you know, credit to San Francisco State University and the Becca program for, you know, um, also instilling me those, those, um, those, uh, I guess, uh, uh, mottos uh, or that type of conscience to have those media literacy uh, and, and taking it into an internship with the Filipino channel and turning that into a career or my current career. How has you worked with the Filipino channel coexisted with the Kapwa Club? It's my way of saying, um, I'm not waiting anymore. Right. Uh, so the Filipino channel, which is great, and they, they definitely gave, gave me the opportunity to tell those stories. A lot of the time, um, I only get so much to, to air each night, Monday through Friday. And that's about two to three minutes to tell the story. And a lot of these stories, you know, when, when I go out there and I, and I interview someone, the interview might go five, 10, 15 minutes long, but I got to cut that down. And normally when I cut it down, it's only about 45 seconds, 45 seconds to a minute. And I have to tell the story. And I get it because, you know, we're cut for time. But going back to, you know, not waiting is like, I have all this material and all these different stories that I can't get on every day. So what? why why hold on to it and, and just keep it as like b-roll or, or file footage and while we while we put it out there so myself and uh jeremiah Isip, um one of the, the co-founder of couple collective we decided that you know what let's be the voice of our community let's let's really tell the story from our eyes and that's what we've been doing what stories do you tell with the Kapwa collective and how have you used it to uplift other filipinos uh the stories we tell are are just, I think the best way I, I like to describe it is like, like I said earlier, you know, Filipino Americans, Filipinos, we're, uh, we're dope, and I think uh, y'all, y'all should, you should know about it. And that, and with that being said, is like, like, whether we're an artist, whether we're a musician, whether we're an athlete, or whether we're activists, you know, we're doing some some very interesting, if not really crazy things. Um, uh, or, or even the community is doing things. I, I like to say um, our most recent was we did a story about a celebrity chef from LA who's actually the Rock's chef, personal chef, one of the Rock's per, many personal chefs. And she was the one who made, uh, created his viral Rock Toast, which is this huge um, French toast. And uh, she took that, and, and since the Rock put it on his Instagram, uh, it went viral. Uh, people wanted it, so now that she turned that into her own uh, small business, and she's been touring up and down California. She's been in, in Hawaii, the Chef Rocky, um, and she's from Vallejo. So when we knew that she was coming out to San Francisco to uh, to sell uh, her her food, you know, we wanted to get we wanted to hook up with her to learn her story, and you know, it's one thing, yeah, it's great, you know, we hook you with like this is the rocks, the personal chef. But, you know, she met her husband uh, in culinary school in, in, in San Francisco, and they're, they're the team behind uh, their, their business, which is uh, Brick French Toastery. And, uh, you know, they, they have a lot of ties to the Bay Area, and, you know, they, they, they just they love coming home, and they love, you know, people supporting them. And also, uh, and then just to juxtapose that the, um, the, the uh, Filipino-American organizations of Activists, uh, like I said, with with the with the housing rights activists to the uh, Black Lives Matter activists, you know, they're they're there, and we're we we were following uh, why they were so passionate, why it was important for them to be in the streets for days, for for literally every day, uh, being with uh, the, with other members of different community, and fighting for racial justice, and why it was important for them, especially young ones, uh, to to understand. Um, you know why to understand why they are taking on a fight that's been going on for for decades and decades in this country we're also now going to show a short little teaser from the Kapwa collective just to give some context for the audience a platform to educate celebrate and highlight the dope things filipino americans been doing this is Kapwa collective 
I've noticed in the video that you have everyone at that at those rallies. You have young people and old people alike. And I've almost noticed that today with activism work, there's a huge gap between the older generation and the younger generation with social media and such. How have you worked to bridge that gap? And I, I, I do this in uh, where my work with the Filipino channel as well. Um, I like to always throw in uh, the, uh, the parent angle. So um, with that example of, of Chef Rocky, the last uh, with my with what I was just talking about with the French toast, um, at the end of it, we we we, we bring back the, the idea of like you know to at least in the Filipino community, I'm sure others, you know it's it's been kind of like okay, well you went to school, are you going to be a nurse now? Are you going to be a doctor now? Are you going to be a lawyer now? Are you going to make that big money? But you know to go a different route like. With, culinary routes or even a music route or anything. And I asked, you know, what were your parents kind of like that? Were they supportive or did they, are they supportive now? Um, and we've noticed that like, that's the, that's like the best way to bridge the gap because, you know, it's one thing when you have someone who's a little older watching a young person succeed, oh, that's great, that's good for them. But then to see that they still have that connection with their parents. And even if in, and if we get the opportunity to interview interview their parents now it's it's representation for them too right so they see like you know oh that reminds me of me or that reminds me of my daughter or my son and, and um maybe we have that relationship or we could have that relationship but that's where i that's where we we, we believe that that's the um that's the silver lining to, to, to hook both uh, generations i know you touched on this a little bit earlier but how does the Filipino community work with the Black Lives Matter community, especially during now? A lot of them have, have been allies, uh, especially when it comes to uh, police issues. Uh, you know, unfortunately, the killing of unarmed people didn't start or stop with George Floyd. Um, these uh, activist organizations have been on the front lines have been in the streets um, for national issues local issues and for um, and for people that unfortunately not a lot of people know about but they've been victims of, gun, of, of police violence uh, and not just police violence and uh, it could be everything from from uh, racism um, from employers or discrimination from employers um, they work closely uh, here in the Bay Area, especially. I, I like to say that um, activist organizations are very, very uh, well connected. So, and it just goes to show there's always strength in numbers. So, when you have like a dozen people out of rally, that's great and that's good. But if you have like hundreds, you know, you're definitely gonna like you have. Your, your megaphone is bigger. It's going to get more reach is what I'm trying to say. And what was it like just to be in those huge communities of multiple communities combined all fighting for similar causes? Uh, it feels like the Bay Area, honestly. Um, yeah, we've, we've seen it in New York and LA and other things like that. But I like to think that like it wasn't new for us, you know, uh, just because that was the community that we grew up with. Those were the people, uh, those were our neighbors who would play on the street with those were our classmates who went to school with those were our coworkers we go to work with so when when we especially um having to travel around the country and seeing how uh, different places aren't so diverse and I, I get it you know it's it's what you can't relate because you don't you don't have those people in, in, in your neighborhood or you don't have those people like in your workplace or in your churches you know so you don't really understand what they're going through but um yeah it's 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 just a reflection of, of the place i grew up and then going back to representation how would you describe the what representation looks like for the filipino community today i think it's a force to be reckoned with uh, honestly because um I don't want to get these numbers wrong, and I'm sorry, I'm supposed to be a journalist. But Filipinos are the uh, highest rising uh, Asian population in California. I think uh, I think we're number, or minority, actually. I think we're number two, if not three. Um, and it's it's just, time is 
time is ticking, you know, with, with the election uh, or with the appointment of the new attorney general for the state, Rob Bonta, the first Filipino American, uh, you know, um, of course he's well qualified, but I also think that it only made sense, right? Because um, there is a lot of Filipino Americans here in the state and uh, to have someone at the helm who's qualified, uh, it, it definitely makes sense. Uh, other representation of this community that I feel are pretty accurate. Obviously, we, we see them as nurses. We all see them as nurses in, in every every uh, hospital, clinic, care home. You know, uh, they are they are there, um, and more. And now in, in music and in entertainment and even in entrepreneurship. You know, uh, Filipinos are. Um, I don't think we, we necessarily have to like claim, you know, we're Filipino, but you know, it's, uh, we're, at least I'm seeing more, at least in mainstream coverage that like when, when, when they interview um, uh, experts or, or just, or first person uh, interviewees, that they're, they're most likely Filipino. And how has the Filipino community fit in with the Asian community as a whole? I, I like to think in the older generation that Filipinos, I think in, in my opinion, um, that they, the older Asian community, they, they're, they kind of just, they stay, they continue to stay in their lane, right? Um, like there is, um, with the Asian supermarkets, uh, there's, you, you'll have an Asian supermarket, but then you'll have a, um, uh, a seafood city, which is like a Filipino owned grocery store. And then in those Asian markets, there, there's other Asian stores, but then with where the secret city is, that's where they'll have the Filipino businesses like your Jollibee or your Chow King or things like that. A lot of stuff that's in the Philippines, right? That made it over here. But now I think um, second and third generation Filipino Americans, they're not so much like kind of keeping space. I think they're, they, they love collaboration, um, whether, especially if it's music, they love it. And I think it's, it's easier now because I've interviewed artists um, from the early 2000s who said like, you know, they, they were facing some racism just because it's like, you know, if you're in hip hop and you're not black, that like they, they would have a hard time. So they had to prove themselves. But I think now, especially in the last 10 years, that it's all about collaboration. They don't care like what color you are as long as you can bring it, you know? When also talking about hip hop, but then also general media, how have you seen Filipino and Asians represented in the media specifically, like music and like movies and things like that? Music, um, let's just thank all the Filipinos from the Bay Area, uh, like Pilo and Sweetie and her. Uh, you know, as far as like those are our big name art, like you throw those names around. Uh, in, in middle of nowhere USA, and, and obviously if you're talking to, to someone who's into hip hop culture, they're gonna know those names, you know? Um, where on the contrast, like Nump or Bamboo, uh, those are big names, still big names, like in the early 2000s. Uh, and you, you say that to the same person, they're not gonna know. But those guys, you know, in music, they are really holding it down. They talked about being Filipino, that's, that's awesome. Um, in other entertainment, Joe Coy is uh, unapologetically Filipino. Uh, obviously, because of the success he's had on Netflix um, and in, in movies, um, you know, we're getting there, right? Um, but um, you know, uh, but Dave Bautista, uh, he 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 holds it down. Bruno Mars, uh, Vanessa Hudgens, the beautiful Vanessa Hudgens, a big fan, obviously, <laughs> you know. Um, she, they, they all, uh, you know, it's, I, I'll just say this about, at least for movies that go, um, as more Asian movies, like, you know, Crazy Rich Asians and things like that, more Asian uh, uh, actors are getting recognized. It's only a matter of time until we see, um, we see more Filipino American actors up there. Darren Chris from, um, from Glee, and he's also in the, I think the Versace, uh, was it Versace? But it was that one on, on on that cable channel where he got that big award. So shout out to them. And then with all these big names in the media, would you say that would you could you point out a specific inspiration? 
Uh, yeah. Um, I would say at least in in the Asian community in general, and I'll, I'll, I'll go micro with Filipino, uh, my inspiration in the Asian community is uh, Isabel uh, Young. She is a correspondent for Vice News. I like to think of her, she's like, she's like the real life Lois Lane. Like she, she is there. She's been in, co in conflict zones in Syria, in the Southern Philippines, Iraq, everywhere. Um, and she, she gets the story done. Um, she's super relatable. She's fearless. Uh, she, she's a huge uh, inspiration to me. Um, and then in the Filipino community, um, I like to say um, Elaine Quijano. Uh, she is a, she's the anchor for CBS Evening News. Uh, she, she moderated the, um, one of the debates between um, Secretary Clinton and former President Trump uh, when they were both candidates. Um, you know these these women are are are, are heroes of mine, and um, you know especially in my field, you know just to see how they go out there and, and they get the job done. And and the big thing about um, at least in this industry, I always tell all my interns and what I've learned at SF State was if you want to be in this business, you got to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. And you know that's kind of an oxymoron, but like it's true. Uh, to to be successful like them, like there are a lot of situations where you got to get the story, and they they come out on, on on the good end multiple times. And then finally, as we begin to wrap up, is there anything else you'd like to add? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, first, thank you again for the opportunity uh, to, to speak with you and to be part of the series. Uh, I just I, I want to echo um, an interview I had with Attorney General Monza yesterday. Um, as we wrap up API Month. Uh, he said that, you know, it's great that we're in solidarity and that we're celebrating each and every one of us, but it shouldn't just be confined to this month, you know, um, next, at least especially uh, within our Filipino American community, because we have this idea uh, that's called a crab mentality that's been, it's been called where, you know, trying to get out of the bucket. So every time someone's trying to get out, someone's, you know, pulling you back in. And, um, but like I said earlier, with this new generation of it's more of a collaboration. And I like to see more of that as, as we step into this new decade, 20, 2020s, right? Um, you know, I think we're on a good a good, good track so far. And, you know, let's, it's time to stop, you know, being against each other and just help each other win. 